Good evening, and welcome to Inches and Cubes, your Toronto-based Warhammer 40k podcast. As always, it's me, Point and Click Nick. Me, Mr. Fist Paul Fowler. And me, Adam, the truest axe. And we're coming at you from a new location deep underground in the heart of Toronto where you'll never find us. Probably not. Like, who has your address? We're back. Uh, Adam, why don't you uh, tell us what our topic is today? Yeah, we're going to pull the usual shenanigans of the hobby desk, the general's armchair, but then also... We each came today prepared with ideas for. Let's use the word prepared. Prepared loosely. loosely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ideas for a new miniature game based in the Warhammer 40k universe. Oh, we said miniature game? Oh, I'm hooped. <laughs> but first, I've got a very special treat for you guys. Mm. Paul's not going to like this. I might. It looks like it's from Nickel Brook. Paul's not going to like this. Is it a sour? Yes, it's a ghost. Go, ga, ghost, ghost, gauss, gauss, gauss <laughs> rhymes with house. Is it a gauss? Uh, it's actually got a good, uh, good explanation there. So I'll, uh, I'm gonna read it off to you guys in a second. But uh, James, uh, crazy James, that's what I'm gonna call him from now on. Introduced me to this beer as you want a beer that tastes like a salad. No, <laughs> so usually. Wait for- <laughs> So, a sour beer with fresh cucumber and lime juice with a hint of sea salt. Sounds insane, right? Yep. Nope. <laughs> this thirst-quenching ghost, and it literally says in parenthesis, pronounced goza, is a perfect balance between tart, refreshing, and citrus flavors. Named for the Roman goddess of agriculture and crops, series is our tribute to the importance of fresh, natural ingredients, wheat and barley, cucumbers and limes, Himalayan sea salt, and a hint of lactobacillus all combined in an all natural sour delight the gods were smiling on our brewers the day they came up with this beauty tastes like a greek salad doesn't it yeah it tastes like salad dressing <laughs> it was freaking awful it's like a, it's, <laughs> it's more like a kombucha than it is a beer oh, it tastes like vinaigrette salad dressing <laughs> yeah it tastes like salad dressing but like carbonated salad dressing like, yeah. I mean... <laughs> it does taste like carbonated salad dressing. Bless their hearts for getting it to taste like salad dressing on purpose, but what, like, they were so preoccupied with if they could, they didn't think if they should. Thanks, Dr. Malcolm. You're welcome. Well, oh, buddy. Sometimes it's, it's uh, an interesting thing that there are things in the world that you don't like because it just helps you know more about and appreciate the things that you do like. Yeah, that's a positive spin. Yeah, if someone was like, this is a herbal drink that'll help you become unconstipated, I'd just drink an entire bottle, because that's what it tastes like. Yeah, it's medicinal. It's, uh... (laughs) It definitely has that medicinal Mm -hmm. kick to it. It's like a Buckley's. It's like a beer Buckley's. But it's like, it's got... It's a mix between a salad dressing and a cough syrup. (laughs) And a goza. Oh, man. This is like... I just got this to hear your reaction. That's the only reason I bought this at the LCBO Like, today. it was worth the $4. Yeah, it, it's... I've had it before. I don't hate it. It just tastes like... Call me crazy, but I like it when my beer doesn't taste like rotting vegetable matter. Like, I like it when they're like, look what we did with the byproduct of that, as opposed to leaning into that that provenance. But here we are. So uh, when, uh, when Paul is uh, sacrificed naked in a field this spring, because he pissed off Ceres... Cersei? Ceres. The Roman god of agriculture no. and goddess. Goddess, probably. Yeah, agriculture and crops. Yeah. And you pissed her off. That's fine. Corn shall grow from your decomposing corpse. Uh, blood, blood, blood makes grass grow. Did you just make that up? No, that's, I think, the Marines. Okay. Like the United States Marines, not the Space Marines. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's true. On this podcast, we have to uh, make yeah. that distinction. Yep. Um, so that's about a, a five-minute segue into how much Paul does not like this beer. I'm yeah. so happy with myself. I'm glad I chose it today. <laughs> it smells awful, too. Um, it smells like salad dressing. Uh, so yeah, Hobby Desk. What do we got? Uh, I got a pretty short one. I failed to get pictures to show you. I finished off the dogs uh, for the Wild West Exodus stuff. Super fun to paint, uh, or super fun to build, sorry. Um, 
And I like how they have their instructions online. So if you need to know how to build something, just it's posted on their website. Um, they went together really easily. Their bases are a little funny. Their bases feel like the bottom of game pieces. And now saying that out loud, they are game pieces. So I guess that's not an issue. Um, but it's like got a beveled edge. Yeah, it's almost like a pedestal. Yeah, it, yeah. it's kind of cool. Yeah, I like it. It, uh, it Once you get the model onto the base, it's like, oh, this has a little bit of kick-ass to it. Um, yeah, so did that. And we had beautiful weather uh, on the weekend. So I primed up uh, all of the uh, commission stuff that nice. I have waiting. And yeah, that's that's fun. I popped them off the bases afterwards, and now they're all glued to stuff I can manipulate them on. And they should go pretty quick, because Terminators don't take too long to paint. Sweet. Yeah, and they're, those are the ones that were uh, designed and, and sculpted by Anvils of Conor, so I'm really excited to kind of get on that, get on that good, good stuff. I, uh, I finally saw him uh, on Facebook. Oh, yeah? So because I don't have the Instagram, I was able to, uh, to like him there, and hopefully right. I'll be able to uh, see a little bit more of his stuff. It's so good, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that, that's that's basically all because my, all my hobby stuff was spent playing games this weekend. What? Yeah, I know. You played games? <laughs> yeah, I can do it. Awesome. So that's yeah. You do, as someone now are, tell are you, me. Are you gonna finish that? Mm, you can have it. Yeah, do you want? Hey, that's good. You can do it. <laughs> I don't. I honestly haven't had a beer that I won't drink in a long time. Oh no, a ten W thirty, the one that tasted like balsamic vinegar. Ooh, uh, I'd try it. Yeah, it it. it it looks like an oil can. I love balsamic vinegar. I could drink Me balsamic too. vinegar. Me too. I love balsamic vinegar. Yeah. I'm not going to drink it. That's I, insane. When I used to work in a fancy food store, I used to hand sell very expensive balsamic vinegar to rich old ladies. It was great. I used to get bored and be like, "How can I sell this $200 bottle of balsamic to somebody? I could. I always could. Because you're convincing them. You're just selling like... Was that Pusateri's? No, it was uh, next to it, I think. It was in the Five Thieves. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so. Right, anyway. right next to $600 pound monkey poop coffee? Uh, it's not monkey. It's, it's a macaque. It's jungle cat yeah. coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. <laughs> Adam, what do you got going on in your hobby desk? Yep, so f- finished the, what is his name? Scabia Thrax? Hmm? Yes, was that close name? enough. Yeah, the great and clean one from Forge Worlds. Uh, really fun. I think I had most of them done last week, but I just added blood drips all over him and finished his base. And uh, I like how he turned out. It was he was a fun model to paint. And then I finished uh, Mortarian. I hadn't done much work on him as of last week, and just basically just finished him up. So that was the bulk of it, uh, the bulk of the the work. Which he's a really cool model. There's a lot going on. Uh, it definitely challenged me if I had more time and I wasn't on the clock like if it was a personal model I could have there's probably some really neat new techniques I could have uh, spent some time learning on him especially those really organic looking wings mm-hmm. um, but I think I still got uh, I think I still got some cool effects going on them like this weird like kind of green fading in of this beige and then kind of just did the typical GW style with the uh, the way he's painted on the box with like the kind of just brown edges all over it and dirt all over his like moth wings. Well, they're not moth wings. What kind of wings are they? Gross. Yeah, just gross. Um, and then made the bottom of his uh, made the bottom of his cloak all like, um, yeah, just just source light because it's kind of turning into these like weird flames. And the GW box art one is like this white cloak turning into these like bluish flames. Um, but uh, the guy I'm painting this for has all of his guys standing on, like, slime green lava. Oh, is um, that why you had that for reference there? Or did you do that yourself? Yeah, those two were there for... Well, I taught him how to do that. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, um, he comes over and he paints every Saturday morning. Well, it's been a while, but... Anyway, and so he was like, I want to do these bases. And I was like, oh, that's pretty easy. And he's like, what, really? <laughs> Yeah, just do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just showed me. Like, oh my gosh, that is really easy. Um, <clears throat> anyways, uh, so because he got the model used, so it was already glued down, so I couldn't do like the 
the same exact effect, so I just made the flames kind of at the end of his cloak match the slime green. Cool. Um, and then another thing that I only took a picture of the box because I forgot to get a picture of the the. the I was progress. wondering what that was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it's like a third party Blood Bowl team of undead stuff. Um, so and it was like undead models from all the different races. There's like an undead orc, an undead. Oh, that's cool. Uh, undead humans. You don't undead. see that enough. Yeah, it was neat. And yeah. every race should be represented in the ranks of the undead. Yeah, they did. They that. don't discriminate. They did that with a character regiment in fantasy battle, like way back in the day. There, oh, yeah? there was like an undead kind of charismatic dude, like he was a skeleton pirate man, and he. <laughs> yeah, would, I remember what you're talking about. Yeah, 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 and he like there was like undead skaven and undead orc and like an elf and stuff. Cool. So yeah. yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. So it's neat. So I put them all together and primed them. Um, the uh, makes you really appreciate how awesome GW's like just plastic molding technology is <laughs> when you put together kind of a, a smaller company's like they're trying their best, you know, and it's it's okay. Mm-hmm. But like it's just so it makes you appreciate how far Games Workshop has come. Yeah. And just like how yeah, just how it's great. It's great to make really nice plastic kits. I know. I mean, you were raving about it, right? That you've been doing resin for so long. Yeah, going and back it, to plastic is, is a. I, I'm going to talk about it in my hobby progress. It's just fun. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to building my uh, Serasis Knight after my, <laughs> my plastic binge. Yeah. So I think that's it. Um, I probably did little bips and bobs, but didn't take any pictures or anything. So cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not too much on my front. Um, after playing, after the, uh, the FAQ dropped, I, uh, really wanted to put a couple biker units in my, uh, in my orc army, so I spent Sunday, uh, finishing building the Wild West Exodus stuff, super easy kits to put together, a few different options, actually. I put together the gun dogs, which, uh, were neat. Mm-hmm. They had some heads that weren't fitting on properly, but then I realized that there's different options for different ones, so I had it all screwed up. And different options for heads, too, because you've got, like, a, a face, so with an actual face, and then you've got, like, a cool kind of badass face mask. Yeah, like a knight's helmet yeah. for a dog. That's also a robot. <laughs> <laughs> no, and for the guys, too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I did those. So I put together the outlaw gun sled and the lawman interceptor, which are crazy looking things for Wild West. So I'm interested to see them yeah. go off. And then kept the theme going with bikes and built two more orc bikers. Uh, started painting up the ones that I already had painted because they're going to be part of my kill team for our kill team event coming up in May. And I had a nervous breakdown. Something went weird in my mind because I was putting together these work bikes and I couldn't find the handlebars to one of the bikes or the bottom legs for one of the bikers. And I tore this place apart. I was like, I was literally like dumping out Bix boxes on a towel to like spread them out and be like, where is it? Because I did a huge cleanup two weeks ago. Okay. I think it was like, I know I haven't been in these in six yeah. months, but no, I, no, I did a, I did a huge look. cleanup and I threw out a whole bunch of sprues. So I was like, I was really worried that I, you know, just kind of like at the end of the day, just like maybe picked up a sprue that hadn't been clipped clean and threw it out. So I gave up. I posted on the Hogtown group being like, I need these two bits. And today I was just looking for a power claw for another uh, model that I'm working on. And I just open up the bits box, and they're literally right there. And I was like, no, no, no. I went through this for <laughs> half an hour, and you were not there. And it wasn't even like I had to rummage around. I just, like, the first thing I saw, I'm like, well. You bastard. I just wasted half an hour of my life on Sunday. Uh, and yeah, just getting paint down. Um, that's about it. Yeah. This Saturday, we're doing a hobby night. For the well, I mean, you just do whatever you want. Yeah. At uh, at Seascape, so come on by. They're giving us the basement, and we'll have uh, access to our own uh, semi-private bar and uh, Nintendo sixty four system. Sweet. Have they like renovated that basement at all? They uh, must have, because it was like a bot fighting arena. <laughs> oh yeah, it yeah. used to be a robot fighting arena. No, they they did renovate it. Last time I went there. They had turned it into like a dance hall, and it was just one dude who was clearly high on something, just like 
doing a crazy arm <laughs> spinning around dance by Just himself. T- dancing away. Oh, but, uh, but Seascape's moving, actually. Where are they moving? Like, they're moving to literally just south on, of Dundas and Kiel on Kiel, where the uh, Magic Oven uh, pizza restaurant is now. Okay. So it's like a two-story standalone building uh, right next to the the Jehovah's Hall of witnesses whatever they call their worship places the kingdom hall the kingdom hall yeah. hall of witnesses so, so that'll be an interesting uh if anyone's there at two in the morning they get to deal with the seascape crowd <laughs> i don't think there will be i don't know uh so yeah no it's, it's a cool spot when i heard that they were moving i was like oh no but uh, that won't be until the end of may but come on down to seascape on uh april 28th uh and- they have 15 dollar pictures of bows that's crazy good deals it's and- really good and you'll get to hang out with people like me. Mm. That's, that's true. I'm busy Saturday. I'm going on vacation for a few days. Oh. Nice. Yeah. I need a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's my hobby progress and a little spiel about that. Uh, why don't we just keep hammering home events have you guys heard about the hog towner you, yeah if you had if you haven't registered spots are filling up come on now come on what are you waiting for really to, stop answering me i can't hear you this is not how this medium works just register for the hog towner yeah uh, let me make it very clear there's there's some good prizes just for showing up you might have the opportunity just for showing up uh to win uh a gaming mat yeah just it's for walking in the awesome. door yeah like, that's a good deal. A double-sided. A double-sided game. It's almost like you have two, but not really, because you can't use them both at the same time. <laughs> yeah, but you've got variety, and that's yeah. that's just as good, right? Uh, how many people have room to set up two tables in their house anyways? That's fair. Yeah. No one I'm friends with. Interesting. That's harsh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, so to be clear on exactly what this thing is... Ah. It's a gaming mat? Oh, the event. The event. Right. Sorry. The 50 person. We officially opened it to 50, right? We did. Okay, yep. good. A 50 person 40k event. Uh we're going we're going hardcore into it. Yeah. Yep. Lots of fun. Heart of downtown Toronto right next to Chinatown. We've got uh baked goods coming for your breakfast. We got chocolate banana bread and cinnamon rolls. Uh Paul tried to veto the cinnamon rolls, guys. He tried to take joy directly out of your mouths. By saying no cinnamon rolls, because apparently he's a madman who doesn't like cinnamon rolls. Okay, but don't worry. Here's... Don't worry. Nick stepped in and just made sure that Paul got his chocolate banana bread. Everyone else is going to get their cinnamon rolls. Here's and the there's going to be coffee, and there's also going to be gourmet grilled cheese, and there's going to be tons of prizes, and the place is licensed, and there's going to be beer. Don't defend yourself. You're a madman. I thought we were talking about our personal preferences, not what we wanted for the event. So that's oh, you why you thought James is just going to bring you cinnamon rolls and I nobody just, else. No, because I like I, I looked at it and I was like, they're discussing baking cinnamon rolls. This is not about the event. Like I, so I was like, cinnamon rolls are bullshit. Like they're not a good dessert, and I'll stand by that. You don't like them, also, You don't like them from cinnabon? No, <laughs> cinnabon <laughs> smells like cinnabon. <laughs> Cinnabon smells like... Don't even do it. I'll knock you out. <laughs> smells like the sweat of other baked goods. I like Eglinton Station just for that alone. Just for that. When the oh, doors man. open on the subway, you're like... Oh, you yeah! Guys are, you guys are disgusting. Bathurst Station smells like Jamaican patties, and Eglinton Station smells like cinnamon rolls. Such good Jamaican patties. The uh, the thing with me and cinnamon rolls is I was like, it's just not breakfast. <laughs> yeah, it's a dessert. Yeah, And it's a bad one. <laughs> No, okay, I disagree that it's a bad one. I think it's a great one. I love it too. Yeah, but it's just not breakfast. But I think it's amazing for what we're doing. Yes. So let's just go with it. I think it's a really good idea, yes. I just don't want it. And coffee. I'll have your share. <laughs> you can have my coffee too. Awesome. They could just be going crazy. <laughs> yeah, let's mix coffee and beer together. Uh, yeah. And uh, so it's a two-day event, and there's, there's, there's breakfast on both days. Yeah, and uh, right now we're up to like $1,500 in prizes. So that's cool. It's amazing. There's going to be tons of prizes. So we're going to be harping on that for a while. So yeah, anytime you hear the word hog tanner, just register again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so Adam, do you have any games played? I don't. Okay, well, before we get into that. I guess it's also important to like say with the hog tanner, we're not taking a profit. 
Oh yes, yeah, no. Like any any uh, that's one thing that we decided early, and I guess hasn't really been communicated. Yeah. But uh, once our our maximum budget has been reached and we've uh, done all of logistics stuff, we're just gonna go to uh, to Sword and Board and buy a whole bunch of extra crap to uh, to give away. We'll we'll just throw stuff off the stage at people. Yeah, it's I will it's... throw a robot Gilliman model at somebody. Yeah, I'll I'll take him down. Yeah, like the idea is we're this is purely volunteer. We're not trying to make any money off of this. We're not trying to pay off any debts that I've incurred due to ill-advised gambling wagers. I'm taking care of that myself. I'm, Look, I I get it, okay? That cock looked like it could beat the other one, but sometimes you just bet on the wrong chicken. Yeah, little Jerry, he went down. Uh <laughs> but, you know, now I'm I'm in hock to uh Octavio, but I'll figure that out. So we're drinking uh, Bob Cajun Starry Night Chocolate Stout. Bob Cajun Brewing Company was founded with one goal, to brew great beers. That's it. You know what? This is the best stout we've had on the podcast, because it just tastes like a stout. It says it's, <laughs> it's, a, cho- it says it's a chocolate stout. Yeah, but... But it, uh, I don't even think the chocolate notes are, are that strong. Oh, they're, they're there. Yeah, but they're it's, definitely there. But it's not like... It's not overly sweet. It's just kind of that creaminess that's no, I, happening. I quite like it. This yeah. is how we get Paul to like stout, is we give him cucumber salt beer. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I like stouts. I just don't like your vanilla stouts or like the stuff that tastes like You cake. like the black coal one that I brought? Yeah, that was pretty good. That's my favorite one, because yeah. it looks like you're just pouring oil out of a can. <laughs> Love it. No light escapes its surface. It's like completely it's, matte it's looking. It's bent to black. <laughs> We mixed eight pounds of Venta Black into this beer. <laughs> now when you look in the... To- no, I'm not going to no. make that joke. Okay, Adam, got any games played? Still no, I bet. Still no. <laughs> in that short time, you haven't played any games. I mean, other than the game that I played with you. Uh, He's always uh, Under the table. I'm... Well, that was Paul then, because we're not sitting together. Oh, well, awkward. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say anything, because I thought you knew what you were doing. But <laughs> now, apparently, it was meant for someone else. That's okay. Story of my life. I'm going to drink my beer. Nick, please tell someone about some games. So, uh, Paul and I actually played each other. Woo! So, Paul played a game, which is really cool, because that hasn't happened in a while. Uh, he actually played two. But uh, So, Paul and I are going to talk about the games that we played not with each other, because we, we're like that. We, we see other people. I'm not jealous about that. So I did my league game against okay. um, Liam Morin and his Death Guard army with my orcs. And uh, it was a slog. Uh, Death Guard are resilient. Um, there was over there were over two hundred models on the table. He was running fifty poxwalkers, two squads of plague marines, a blight drone, typhus. Terminators, Chaos Lord, uh, the Bell Dude, the we Noxious can, Blightbringer. Why can we never remember Bell Dude's name? But, like, the Tally... I think it's the Noxious Blightbringer. Yeah. Biologist Putrefier, which I want to go into depth later, because Liam used this on me, it surprised me, but he didn't use it nearly as good as he could have. Basically what happened was, we had the FAQ drop, talked to Liam about it, we agreed to play with the FAQ and uh, the beta rules. He went first. Moved his pox walkers up. I didn't even need to jump. I was just able to charge in first turn. And it was just a slug fest. Uh, so he, pox walkers, whenever they kill a model, uh, they get a model added back to the squad. He popped a stratagem every turn. Um, that every time a unit a model die within seven inches of his big squad of twenty, they'd get a model back. And it was just yeah, it just took forever to slog through this army. And it basically came down to it was a really close game because the Death Guard have this really, really cool tactical objective called like Nurgle's Rot or something to do with numbers. And at the end of your turn, if you score, if you've killed seven enemy models of any kind, you get a victory point. For every additional multiple of seven, you get another victory point. He's playing orcs. <laughs> so is there are some times where I'm taking 14, 20, 21 models off the board. That's three victory points for him. So we were really, really close, but it was this really weird game that didn't have a game turn length. It was Maelstrom of War, and the game ended once one player scored ten tactical objectives. Ah, uh, yes. And then that turn, the game ended. Uh, so I, uh, so Liam had to call it, because unfortunately with all the models, and he's still getting into the, the game and not, uh, not as quick 
Um, and, and orcs are not any faster either, so it was two really slow armies playing against each other. Uh, he had the jet. He had uh, he had a Muay Muay Thai Muay Thai Muay fight, Thai fight yeah. but he won. So congratulations, Liam. Uh, Did he win his game versus me? Yeah, no, no. Nah. So he gave in, and we like mathed it out, and uh, I drew the next three objectives that I would have gotten to get to ten, and I was like, okay, I would have scored two of these. I would have gotten line breaker because I had some commandos behind his lines. Uh, but it was just a really, really fun game. He used a stratagem called Blight Bombardment um, with a Biologus Putrefire nearby. So Biologus Putrefire basically ups the uh, the putrefaction-ness of Blight Grenades. Uh, he gives them plus one strength and plus one damage. So Ooh. now these things are strength five, damage two, AP negative one. And he uses a stratagem called Blight Bombardment. So everybody in the Plague Marine squad throws one. So it's 10d6 shots. It's got a hit. What uh, what he missed out on, and again, just him learning rules, and this would have... I don't think it would have changed the game because he was targeting an empty battle wagon. But they also cause mortal wounds on sixes. To oh. oh, he just forgot. He just forgot that. And they're death guard. You can pop the stratagem granting them plus one to wound. So, so now they're strength five... Wounding a battle wagon on fives, no fours, I don't know fives. What's the toughness of a battle wagon? Eight. So it would have been fives already if they were strength five. Yeah, but the mortal wounds would so have gone off on a five or a six, which is when you've got ten d six shots incoming. That would have been a dirty, mm-hmm. terrifying. Um, MVPs uh, for me that game uh, were just uh, just orc boys. They just seemed to get the work done. They uh, they killed typhus. Uh, they killed a Chaos Lord and a squad of Terminators. And uh, the Weird Boys are also great because they just act as uh, as collection points and then they just smite things. Go smite. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's a really fun uh, really fun list. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to playing Liam again. But uh, goddamn Boxwalkers. Oh my god. <laughs> There's something else, man. Because Typhus gives them plus one strength, plus one toughness. Then you can give them another psychic power to give them plus one toughness. Uh, and they just, they hit on five, so they're not great, but they don't fail morale. They're immune to morale. Mm-hmm. So you can't budge them. And anytime something dies, it's like, no, no, that squad's back up to 20. Oh, that squad's down to 10. Pay a command point. Oh, that squad's back up to 20. Oh, this squad over here. Like, I'm going to talk about reanimation protocols and how much they pissed me off in my game versus Paul. I the, mean, the, it's, it's These cute. were way better. It's cute that you're complaining about a big blob of infantry when you're running around with 30 boys. Yeah, they don't come back from the dead. No, but they have a 5-up invulnerable save. Yeah, well, we'll and they can we'll, teleport. We'll get, to, we'll get to that. So, like... So, how was, uh, how was your game? I fought uh, our, our resident... One of our resident uh, Mechanicus players. Um, Mechanicum? What one am I dealing with in 40k again? Mechanicus? Mechanica, Mechanicus. Um, yes. So he was running uh, four robots with shooty robots, and then one punchy robot. Then the three of the guys with the tracks, um, destroyers. Yeah, destroyers. Catafron destroyers, not just destroyers. Right. Call uh, one one chicken walker and two units of Skatari. I think that was it. Um, and I was running. We were doing infiltrators. Some- yeah, and a unit of infiltrators. We were running um, 1750, uh, just because now we're, we've decided everyone's going to start training for the Hogtowner. Um, so get your 1750 lists uh, up and running. And I love the new Necron Codex. Like, I, I tested it out in two games on Saturday, and having the Deceiver in... Uh, my list was... Five wraiths, three destroyers, one heavy, uh, a unit of scarabs, of all things, uh, a lord. That was one detachment that had the automatic six advance, uh, uh, craft world, not craft world, uh, two yeah, craft world, two world, craft world. Get out of here. Chapter tactic. Chapter tactic. Then. Fleet. Yep, all of those things. Obsession. Are, are there a couple more you'd like to do before I continue? Legion. All right. Regiment, uh huh. High fleet, sept. Okay. I already said. I already said high fleet. Don't repeat me. I don't listen to you. So I, I don't blame you. <laughs> Especially when you're stepping on my bit. So, anyways, 
Uh, then in my other detachment, I did a battalion. Um, 20 warriors, 5 immortals with Gauss, 5 immortals with Tesla, uh, the, the, the Praetorians with the Warsythe, a Deceiver, Overlord, and a Cryptek. Wait, the Praetorians had Warsythes? Uh, no, sorry, Rods of Covenant. Right, okay. Um, and yeah, so I was able to redeploy the unit of Wraiths w- by using the uh, using the Deceiver's The Grand Illusion, which is my favorite trick now. It's good, man. You have to, you have to deploy them outside of 12. Wraiths move 12, so you're getting a first turn charge. And advance 6, and you can pop a stratagem. Honestly, I think I might stop running the advanced six in that and go with one of the more like combat oriented ones because I'm getting in there. I don't need the the six inches of movement because I can advance anyways. Yeah, I think uh, I think it might be worth it to have really fast moving troops when you start playing like Maelstrom games and need to go for objectives. I don't know. Yeah, what's the other one? Like, reroll wounds when you charge? I think so. Something like that. Oh, that's pretty good. And the stratagem with that is, like, three... I think, if I'm remembering correctly, it's, like, three command points and you attack again. Whoa. Which is a lot of command points, but you're using it on a unit of rates. Oh, also, we had more command points than we're used to. Exactly, so spend those. Uh, but first turn, I was able to wipe out the uh, the destroyers that were screening for the robots. The cataphrons, not your own destroyers. Yes, the my destroyers killed his destroyers, um, and it was it it came down to a game of just uh, him him. He he basically was at a losing game of like trying to uh, allocate damage correctly, and I was just pushing too many like D three shots through, so they all ended up kind of eating crap and dying. Uh, and then I just tied up the robots in combat the entire game, so his like biggest unit of uh, offensive troops, the squad that puts out sixty four shots a turn. Yeah. They just, they couldn't get it done. Um, they're not great in assault. What were they in combat with? The Wraiths. Ah. So the Wraiths got a first turn charge. They were just stuck in. and he, like He let you first turn charge the robots? He didn't have a chance. He, he screened it with something. I don't know. He didn't, he didn't realize that uh, the Deceiver's ability trumped the FAQ. Uh, deployed. <laughs> didn't, oh, it doesn't trump no, anything because no, no. it, it's no, no, written no. down. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I managed to get Dude, it in I, there. I use the same rule. I'm not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was able to get in there um, and just shut down, like, this most powerful unit. Um, and then he put Call into combat. So one turn I put every attack into Call and, like, killed him. <laughs> because they're, the Claws are forcing his invuln, which is five. And it's two damage. So, like, one or two would go through every turn so one turn of my combat one turn of his combat call was dead you got him yeah he's a lot easier to kill than seventh edition Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah Yeah. so that was that was satisfying um and i managed to like just table him by turn five so hey sounds fun it was fun for me i don't think he was having a great time i like was it mike or matt mike um mike chapman yeah like it it Honestly, like, it, I didn't feel great about it. Like, it was super yeah. fun to see how effective my stuff was, but... You loved it. No, well, no, because, you know, Mike wasn't having a great time with the game, and it was it was kind of like... Yeah, well, we need him to win some games so he doesn't get bummed out about 8th edition. Yeah. That's yeah. But, yeah, it was just like a, a slugfest for a while. And one, once I shut down, his, like, the middle of his army, like... The, the rangers couldn't get it done. Yeah. And... and there's no stopping those rates when you're just in your face. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't fall back. Like, it, it'd be pretty hard to well, bubble wrap around his robots. But... Somebody stopped them that day. Yeah, you did it the way you're supposed to do it with weight of attacks. <laughs> like, yes. yeah. Nah. And I knew. I, I, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Anyways, <laughs> me and Nick also played a game that day. Yes. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, like I said, I was just having flashbacks to the Death Guard game. Uh, but yeah, let, let's actually... We've got... We're here. Mm-hmm. Let's go through it. Yeah. We, yeah, because uh, two Xenos armies. I checked off on two more factions on my list of all factions with the Orcs. Which I'm super stoked about. 
Uh, so we kind of set up. Uh, I'm trying this new kind of like starting formation that uh, worked out really well for me. So basically it's the uh, the Big Mac in the middle, flanked by Battle Wagons, with uh, a bubble of the 30 Orc Boys. So everybody's within 9 inches of the Force Shield, mm-hmm. which means everybody has a 5 and vulnerable save first turn. Which is great. Uh, I learned it from Connor, and the Orcs have adapted. <laughs> No, they've stolen an idea. They've adapted. Uh, and then I use a, a, a flanking squad of, uh, of Storm Boys to hop on objectives and, uh, and just push a flank. And uh, what, was your, uh, what was your setup plan? Um, my plan, I, I wasn't taking this game as seriously as I ought to have. I was just sort of like, I'm going to try this out. Um, but you say once you lose. I say it like... <laughs> Anyways, spoiler alert, Cheap Nick. shot. I know, he's such a dick. Like, <laughs> you want to just explain the game then? If you we were did. both... Ha- yeah. That's just that's a weird thing to say. <laughs> After I lost, I'm going to say I wasn't taking it seriously. We, I said that I, I, when I, we were setting up. I was like, I'm just going to try this. Yeah, I was just trying out my list too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Uh, After you stomp Mike, yeah, I'm just going to... I'm tabled a guy, but I'm just going to take this game super light. I just tabled an ad mech player. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah. I didn't feel great about it. I don't like, I don't like the appeal. Adopt it. <laughs> don't deny it. No. Anyways, what was your, what was your battle plan? Um, same thing, move the wraiths up. This time I had planned to move the deceiver with the wraiths. Uh, go in and go after the 30 man unit of boys with the wraiths after I soften them up with the satans. Um, Sky meteor power, which you roll a d6 for every member in the unit, every uh, model in the unit, and on a six it takes a mortal wound. Thirty boys, that's going to get you some mortal wounds. Should be five. And I mean, it could be more, it could be less. You know how dice are. Then charge the wraiths in. Use the deceiver to hop over and go after one of the either the warlord or one of the the weird boys and i just forgot to move the deceiver up because i got excited about wraith oh, uh, like you didn't i didn't move him up and like continue the plan oh like you didn't charge him in along with him? i didn't even move him to where i had planned to and like because oh. he's, he's got to do the movement before the game starts and then he's like the game started oh i forgot to move him it's yeah like, we've started the game now. yeah like, you can't do a redeploy right so i was like all right that oh, goes like what had you already done i had like He'd shot and <laughs> Oh, like you're I, I was, already in the shooting phase. Yeah, yeah I was yeah. like, oh, I meant to do that, and I was like, well, you know what? Let this be a lesson for like, yeah, you don't you don't learn without penalty for failure, and you also don't deceive very well if you. Yeah, <laughs> you also had a tesseract arc too. Yeah, I had a tesseract arc. I'm always unimpressed with that in seventh edition. To be fair, I mean, I think you shot it twice at a battle wagon first turn. I made both invulnerable saves. Yeah, so it's like one of those things where it's, but yeah. it's just like. It's a cool model. It looks rad, um, and it's got some like fun effects. But for like two hundred and fifty points, it's a little squishy, and its gun got worse yeah. from seventh to eighth. Um, it's just not as it's not as flavorful as it used to be. It still blows up really easily. So I mean, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> You're not going to use it as a yeah. It, I a might destruction arc. Or yeah, I might arc. use it as a doomsday arc because yeah. it's got the same pilot area yeah. um so yeah i moved up and like started digging into the boys um and the wraiths the way to kill wraiths is just weight of attacks it's the way you kill anything with the three up invulnerable save is push saves because three ups are great and the you know they they do really good work but you, you just have to put more dice in hands when 15 guys are getting 65 attacks mm-hmm. it's, it's pushing through and I, I was also yeah i was also able to smite them uh you also push the praetorians up a flank too yeah i pushed the praetorians up to stop the the storm boys from coming down the uh, the left side of the board just because i didn't want to have to deal with them yeah and i didn't want to have to i didn't want them to get a charge i knew the praetorians hit pretty hard they're only five man so it's only 10 attacks but they uh, I popped a stratagem where they were re-rolling their ones, which gave me, I think, like two or three more wounds uh, in the first phase. So, like, I feel like that was the right call there. 
Oh, it definitely was. Uh, and kind of sacrificing the wraiths to tie up the twenty man, or the thirty man unit of boys. Yeah, totally right call. Yeah. Like, but it, uh, it was funny. It was, that was your turn. I don't think you really did anything else. No, like shooting was a bit meh. Yeah. Uh, so it was funny when Paul told me that he's like, the wraiths did their job. I'm like. That's funny, because if I had gone first, I would have charged the 30-man orc boys into the race to tie them up. <laughs> yeah, but the thing the thing about letting you get that charge yeah. is you're engaging my entire gun oh, line. Oh, for sure. Like, you would, you would just, it would just be the exact same thing that I did to yeah. Mike. Yeah. I was like, can't let you do that. So I, I had a I had a fun first turn. Um, I was able to beat down the, the wraiths in combat, I think at the end of my turn, uh... They were wiped. Yeah, because then you deep struck uh, the next turn you did that. Mm-hmm. But uh, we'll get to that when we talk about the next turn. Woo! Um, just beat up some Praetorians a little bit more. He had uh, two left. I forgot they could fly, so I was like, I'm going to surround you. <laughs> Didn't work. Couldn't no. could fly away. Um, then I was able to fly the Burna Bomber over a squad of Immortals, drop bombs, kill three, then the Burna, Burna Bomber shot, killed the other two, and I was like, yes, no reanimation protocols. Um, smited some of the race, which definitely helped soften them up. Was, that did more work than the boys. Probably. You killed two with it, smites. It's, yeah, because I, I got some really high rolls off of with, uh, with smite. And I uh, just started pushing battle wagons up the board. Uh, none of us... We, we Again, we were both having fun just like slugging it out with a, a new army. But we completely forgot about the objectives, I think, until turn three. Yeah. We're like, oh, wait, what? Oh, right. We need to actually score the objectives that are and, on the table. And, like, that's why I said to you, I feel like I could have pulled that game off because I had two backfield characters that weren't doing anything. Yeah. So, like, mm. So this was an interesting mission. So we ended up playing Dawn of War, uh, but essentially one objective is at the center of the table, and then one objective is exactly 18 inches away, the other objective is also exactly 18 inches away. But 12 inches from each deployment zone. So it's right in the middle of the board. So there's no backfield camping. You have to get up there. And if your character uh, is on an objective, the first turn is on an objective, you get one point. Second turn on the objective, you get two points. So now you have three points. Third turn is three points. So now you have six points. So it, it starts to snowball. And um, we just completely forgot about that. Neither of us ever got a character on a point. On a, I oh, oh yeah you scored one objective but you didn't stay on it well i just i did though we didn't count that right uh you're but, satan no i got the i got my lord on it at the end of the game with the destroyers right so that's just one point because you right. held it for one turn uh but second turn rolled around and uh paul got to use a special relic I used the Veil of Darkness, my favorite thing in the world, and just threw a 20-man unit of warriors in front of the 30 boys and was able to whittle them down to, I think, under 10? No, no. I was I was kind of unimpressed. You, I think you only killed, like, 12. Yeah. And shooting. And I had, get like... 30 minus 12 is... 18. And okay. the race didn't kill that much. No. Again, they just got buried under... Yeah. Um, but, eh, like, the the issue I have with orcs is that you can get them up to 30, and you can't ever affect their leadership. So it's the same problem that you have with the Pox Walkers, yeah. where it's just this, like, big, really hard to, like, move unit, and yeah. they're, they never worry about leadership. Yeah, unless there's one guy left, then I'm not going to spend command points. Uh, orcs have a great ability on some of their HQ characters and just characters in general called Breaking Heads. So if a unit fails a morale test, they just take D3 wounds and they pass. Yeah. And I'll do that every day of the week. Yeah. Um, and, like, I'm not complaining. I think it's a cool, it's a cool mechanic. Uh, it's just that you have to push out so much fire. And... You know, when you're when they've all got like a five up involved, like I don't know why you're saying that you're not impressed because a five up. They didn't involved. have it for that because the, yes, they did. They, no, because the entire squad wasn't within. I said you had to kill fifteen orcs, and then I get the five up involved. Yeah, so and I I pushed them into the five up. No, I'm almost positive. against the warriors. I didn't get a save because you were like okay. these are at minus two. I'm like cool, so I have an eight <laughs> up save. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Look, you got weapons already for my save. Yeah. 
gas weapons are so good. Uh, and then this is where the, the funniest part of this whole game was. So there was a choke point where Paul deep struck his, his warriors. And so, and so in my turn, um, moved up, finished off the Praetorians with the Storm Boys. Because the Storm Boys ended up doing really well that game. There were two guys left that just jumped around hitting things with a power claw. They helped blow up a, an Annihilation Barge on yeah, one like flank. Four, five attacks with a power claw is yeah. good. Like, mm-hmm. Oh, it's definitely good. Like, that's not surprising. No. Uh, but the, the funniest part, and what I really liked, was the uh, the choke point. So there was a blob of 20 warriors and a cryptic. And I charged him with uh, whatever was left of the boys. Another squad got out of a battle wagon, charged in there with them. And then a squad of commandos charged the 20 boys, uh, 20 warriors. And I was able to get them down to four. Four guys and a cryptic. My and, turn rolls around. And he rolled... 13 out of 16 reanimation protocols. <laughs> nice. Like, <laughs> so I like chained them over to get an objective because I was like, yeah, might as well do that. And then I like surrounded stuff and I managed to, of the initial charge, I killed everything in combat like over yes. two turns. So it was like a squad of boys, a squad of boys? Yeah, squad, it's just two, two squads, squads of boys, boys and a squad of commandos dead by the hands of... Necron warriors yeah. just so then a second squad charged in and then a second squad of commandos charged in brought them all the way down to four again guess how many reanimation protocols he made on turn three 13 out of 16 yes <laughs> mm-hmm. again <laughs> just like because <laughs> the cryptic it's four up and i didn't have to pop any um any stratagems and i should have i should have you should have done the reroll ones yeah. yes um and, but I, it was just so funny. So they killed another squad of commandos. <laughs> so the last the last squad finished them off. Yeah. Um, but it was totally worth it. Uh, my war boss almost killed a god. <laughs> he charged in with Headwampus Kill Choppa, landed two sixes to wound, which means uh, 2d3 mortal wounds. Uh, brought him down to, like, what? One. One wound. And then Paul made... <laughs> three four invulnerable saves the, the rest of the uh you and your goddamn four invulnerable saves every time yep uh, and so then the just star turn... god just i'll let you tell yeah him. just like turns around and just like mashes his head with both hands <laughs> and, and then and then the boys charged in and killed him yeah because that's how you kill anything in the necron codex is boys just are just so much fun low damage high amounts that's how you kill necrons and uh honestly i think it's it's a unit that is often overlooked is the knob with the wog banner just makes orcs so good the plus one to hit within six inches you're hitting power claws on threes everybody else is hitting on twos oh it's just like yeah. it's really good like it's, really it's good. very like especially when it's a unit of i don't know probably by this time 18 19 boys like it just it feels bad and I cast Warpath on them to give them an extra attack. So now they have five attacks. Hitting on twos. Hitting on like, twos. So Ooh. it's just like, that's how you kill Necrons. Yeah. Um, and yeah, my Destroyers, there's a stratagem for one point where they reroll all hits and wounds. Fantastic. Um, probably going to bulk out that squad. Um, destroyers are so good. Though. Yeah, they're, the, they're like the sleeper hit of the summer. Um, so you didn't kill any of my vehicles. You ignored the burner bomber once it dropped both bombs, so it was just flying around doing nothing. Yeah, because it's kind of useless. It was hitting on sixes, so yeah. I was like, I don't care. Yeah, uh, which, is, which is always hilarious. Mm-hmm. Uh, the war bug, uh, yeah, because you know he's got this big, cool, two hundred and fifty point unit in the backfield. You've noticed he hasn't talked about it at all. Yeah, because it couldn't kill anything. Because it was fighting off war buggies and commandos, and it just wasn't getting it done because like its weapons are either d6 shots or d6 shots and like d6 shots kind of sucks because you're yeah. you're sometimes eating crap and shooting once especially yeah. when it's just a missile launcher yeah it's not right? it's not a good unit yeah if you're um, like it's d6 shots and it's strength 12 ap negative 5 <laughs> d6 damage minimum 3 yeah. Okay. Cool. Mm-hmm. What is just a D six shot missile launcher? You're like, why? Yeah. Why is this a thing? Cool. That's a collapsing sun. Great. Great. That's what the weapon is. It's a I black know. hole. I know. Like it's contained awesome. in a little sphere. Um, it should be more powerful than it is. It definitely should be. Mm-hmm. You should probably get one of those uh, Necron Realm of Battle tiles. <laughs> <laughs> 
but uh, I'll definitely rematch your Necrons uh, anytime. I know you've uh, you've made some changes to your list. Uh, oh, so I think I won by like one or two points because we only really started going for objectives turn three onwards. And again, both of us were really just more interested in bashing heads that game than scoring objectives. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, you're, and you're, you're I, a good opponent. Yeah, I got a lot a better handle on how to use the Necrons. It was only my second game with the new Codex, and they function a lot more aggressively than they did in the index they're fast they're fast they're they're very very fast a lot of combat buffs yeah Yeah. um and i think that's something that's really interesting that you think that you can assault the necrons out of effectiveness you can't like warriors are just as good as a marine in combat they're better because they come back yes like but i mean in pure damage output yeah they're yeah but uh you know but Hitting this is, on threes, winning on fours. But here's the thing. This is a conversation uh, that I had with Connor about looking at your points values, breaking it down over the turn. Mm-hmm. So being like, how much do I want to pay for this per turn? And Necrons, I really think that the Warrior, the that value is there because it's not like you can effectively eliminate it for the rest of the game. It just kind of like creeps back up. Yeah, unless, unless, you, unless you knock them out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I mean... I'm I'm still getting a handle on the orcs, but uh, I just love playing assault and really just being aggressive. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Oh, also scarabs. I love scarabs. Oh yeah, scarabs have <laughs> flies, so they can assault flyers. They were assaulting my burn bomber. I blew one up and like did some mortal wounds, and then I was like, "That's cool." And I tried it again. On I, I tried to kill the uh, the, the storm, storm boys. boys. I rolled a one. I rolled a one because like the stratagems is you pop it on a two up. Uh, you remove a base and... Well, you remove a base and then roll a dice. On a two-up, the squad takes D3 mortal wounds. And I just rolled a one. So they, I was like, man, that would have been cool. Like, I don't want to spend another command. Oh, yeah, and the knob just killed the rest of them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, I don't know. I really, like, I really like scarabs again. Yeah, for sure. Because they're pretty... You also forgot about them for two turns. I did forget about them. I was them like, Paul, you got some scarabs. He's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, neat. You're not holding an objective back there. No, no. <laughs> so it could have been a, closer than you thought oh yeah no yeah. I could have handily won that game I think uh, and that's not like you know saying anything about your abilities as a player because I know you're good but I just think like if I had played a little bit smarter I would have been able to really force some tough choices on you and if I had been playing a lot smarter it would have been a very different game I'll get out of here alright we'll go on to our next game with uh, with a different attitude then alright no more friends I got lots of friends <laughs> Well, not about that. Just oh. I just I just wanted to like my main goal was like I'm gonna kill that squad of twenty warriors. I don't really care about anything else. That's what I'm gonna do this game. Yeah, I, I did it. I did it. I just the the two weird boys in the backfield are just so annoying because like there's nothing really I can do. Oh, the other thing is I chose the wrong. I should have went with um, enduring will. I think is the name of the warlord trait, which lets you deny the witch. Oh yeah, that would have been helpful mm-hmm. for sure. Yep, yep. Um, as though you were a psyker. So I was. It's like, tough because like the weird boys are getting plus two, plus three to their psychic test, but any sort of defense against being, you know, smited. And I got the the d six moral wound smite off. I think at least once. Yeah. Warpath off a few times. Yeah, smite just feels bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I don't know. Maybe I should adopt it as a tactic, but I don't know. There's just something about like mortal wounds that I don't like. I mean, Necrons are a high mortal wound output with the stuff they have. Tesseract Vaults and yeah, the Star Gods. Yeah, but they're also, that. like, uh, I think Paul's just a little sad that uh, that Wraiths are so vulnerable to mortal wounds. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, Because totally. in old editions, yeah. you're like, no, I got a 3-up and vulnerable save, and it's like, nope. Yeah, and I'm not complaining, because, like, they did buff the Wraiths now that they're, like, minus 2 and 2 damage. Um, and they they actually function the way they ought yeah. to, so they're Terminator killers. Of- yeah, that's another interesting thing about your army because like I know the Triarch Praetorians, the Rod of Covenant's more than one damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, all your race are two damage. You've got so much multiple damage weapons that are just completely wasted against a hundred and twenty one wound toughness four infantry models. Yeah, uh, and like that's everybody's army yeah. against your army. But anyways, those are the games we played. Uh, so I just want to. I know we talked about the FAQ last week, so I just wanted to share a little funny story that happened. So the FAQ came out, 
and we talked about the beta rules for Deep Strike. And immediately there were issues about does this apply to uh, to models that started on the table? And uh, there was like a, a lot of arguments back and forth uh, in the forums with GW, saying. which well like... after they after they cleared <laughs> it, they, people were arguing with Games Workshop on their on their ruling. Um, but I, we talked about this on the last podcast. Essentially, there was another FAQ buried deep in the big rule book that said if a, a model starts on the table and then is redeployed with things like Veil of Darkness or the Jump, uh, they count as arriving from reserves for the purposes of moving and shooting. A lot of people interpreted that as they always count as arriving from reserves. Uh, so like I said in the last podcast, I said I was going to run the Jump the safe way. Mm-hmm. Um, but it uh, didn't happen because I didn't get to use the Jump either game because I went second both times. Uh, but in Games Workshop, uh, three days later, released a, a top five units affected by the the changes to the FAQ, or top great units after the FAQ drop. And it made it very clear that weird boys can make boys jump mm-hmm. after, like during turn one. And it said but any, just... any model that starts on the table and is redeployed is exempt from this uh, beta rule. And people went nuts. They're like, you're disagreeing with yourself. You have to be consistent. It's like, why are you arguing they with are... the rules designers on their Facebook page? Also, they are being consistent. Like, they're saying, no, this interpretation of of uh, something that is is a little unclear is this way. Yeah. We're, not, we're not being inconsistent. We just didn't word it great. And now we're fixing that. And people are like, no. I thought it was this way, and you guys suck. I'm like, well, take your freaking models and go home. <laughs> yeah, it was like it was, like, it was a totally different way uh, 24 hours ago. So how would you just be quiet? Yeah, yeah. just yeah. sit on your hands. You just weirdo. ask the question. Be like, hey, can you clear this up? Okay, thanks for making it clear. Perfect. That's exactly what I asked for. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm really happy with the changes to the jump. Obviously, because I'm going to use it. Mm-hmm. And uh, Paul gets to use his deceiver. I love it. I love a redeploy. Yeah, tactic. It's the best. Especially during the game. Mm-hmm. I, and not like uh, I hold them in reserve and then deploy them. Because you can like really terrify somebody, right? Like if you have a squad of race, you throw them on the right flank. And they're not going to put anything on that right flank. So now you've been able to control that. And you throw them over the left flank with the redeploy. And it's just like, oh no! Ah, my squishy bits! You just have no idea where the race are coming from. It's great. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's super cool. Where's but, uh, the Wraith set? You can't see me, John Cena style. But it was a fun game, and uh, Saturday was uh, just a, a really cool day. Uh, our our community is just constantly expanding. Every table was packed at Sword and Board again. Yeah, you uh, had to put quarters down on the tables to get like yeah. a game in. You had to wait for people to finish. I loved it. It was really cool. And uh, then we went uh, had a couple beers afterwards. Yep. It was a lot of fun. I ate chicken fingers. Oh, so many chicken fingers. Man, Duffy sucks. Duffy's does suck. Oh, don't. <laughs> it really does. Five dollar chicken wings is pretty good. When, yeah. Wednesday night. Yeah, well, that's fair. After training night, it's a good time. Yeah, because it's also ten dollar pitchers. Yeah. Well, twelve dollar pitcher. Yeah, see, I'm like they're like charging twenty two dollars for a pitcher of booze. <gasps> I'm like, I can go to Seascape and get this for fifteen, and they'll probably forget to charge me for three of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, Why are they moving? Uh, they said bad lease, and they didn't like their landlords, and uh, now they have a two-floor place. Okay. That's not a basement. Yeah. Which is always solid. Uh, so, yeah, that was a, a really long intro segment, but that's totally fine, because uh, you guys really like your, your games played. <laughs> I'm talking to the listeners, not to, uh, to Adam and, and Paul. Yeah, he pointed. But uh, let's, yeah. let's throw down again. No. Nah. I'm okay with that. I'll just <laughs> take the win. Yeah, all right. I'll lie and say that you're lying and you didn't win. There were witnesses. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come at you with the main topic. Battle Brothers Studios, a commission painting service passionate about making your miniatures and your gaming table look great. Our philosophy at Battle Brothers is this. Your army is our army. Every model will be something you can be proud to show off. Send us a message on Facebook.com slash Battle Brothers Studios for a free quote and make that dream project come to life. 
We also have something special planned for the release of 8th edition of 40K. Right now, get 20% off if you commission us to paint an 8th edition starter set. Or get a 10% off army bundle bonus for painting up your new 8th edition 40K army. Inquire with us on Facebook for full details. You know, when I'm not cracking cold ones, I'm popping paint pots and putting brush strokes on miniature figurines. And you know darn right that I'm getting my supplies from thewarpainter.com, a hobby store in the Great White North. Thewarpainter.com is Canada's greatest hobby store for all things hard to find. Scale 75, Broken Toad, The Army Painter, and Valet Ho. All supporters of Encounter Wargaming get 10% off their first order with the code EWG10. They got you covered. We're back. We're back. Nick is opening up a Blood Brothers Chumet. Chumet. Which is a very high octane IPA. Woo, it's 7%. Yeah, and that's what they serve at Ronnie's. And when you're on the patio at Ronnie's and you've had an amount of Chumets, they hit you all at once. Mm. Like, there have been many a morning where I've woken up and just been like, whose idea was this? Just... Are, they are priming their bottles, though, yeah. which always pisses me off. What's, uh, what's Ronnie's? Ronnie's is a bar in Kensington Market. Mm. And it's... And they run Blood Brothers, eh? Yeah. That's cool. This is kind of like their flagship beer. Yeah. It's, uh... It's bitter. It's floral. And it's very, very drinkable. It's probably... Yeah, I was going to say right up your alley. <clears throat> yeah, I, I really like this one. He's As a beard. The... He wears ironic t-shirts. He rides a bike around. I don't wear He's ironic. He's a hipster. Therefore, he likes IPAs and only IPAs. I think we've cracked the code mm-hmm. on Paul's. Uh, okay, first off, a hipster is not a thing. That's just someone who likes stuff you like in the wrong way. Yeah, so you. What? Get out of here. <laughs> I ride a bike because I have no money. <laughs> <laughs> it's also part of being a hipster. <laughs> Yeah, he's right. I hate you both. <laughs> Do you work in a weird industry? We don't talk about my job on air. <laughs> You're checking all the boxes here, buddy. <laughs> you know what? I don't care. <laughs> Do you have a tattoo? Nope. Ooh, all right. No tattoos? No piercings? He's too much of a wimp. <laughs> I'm the same reason. I can't do needles. That's why I will never get a tattoo. I just don't want a tattoo. What's that? That's that's a a scar. It's a a penis. (laughs) Yeah, it's a a scar of a penis. It's a a pentagram on the back of your neck. (laughs) Oh no, the birthmark's back. (laughs) Guys, if you have any stocks in farms, I would sell them all now. Because of the blight that that... Yeah, because you insulted the Roman god of agriculture. Yeah, she's fine. So Adam, what are we what are we doing? Yeah, so the uh, the idea was a few weeks ago. We're always trying to come up with podcast ideas. Um, so if you have any fun ideas, then uh, hit us up on Facebook. And if you want to be on a podcast, write an episode and then hit us up on Facebook, and we'll just mock you. No, we'll we'll <laughs> we'll, play, we'll have a live play along. We'll have a great time, definitely. Um, but yeah, so this is just an idea I came with, up with under the pressure of having to come up with an idea the day before the podcast, uh, where I said, "Hey, let's each make a." Uh, war, a new miniature game themed in the 40k universe and then present our idea and so I figured it doesn't have to be fully fleshed out but we would just take ideas and chat about them and um, and see what we can come up with together so the the one as soon as you said this this is like did anyone play the game uh, Mafia or Werewolf or oh uh, yeah it's just all those ones where like you close your eyes and, well, you're dealt cards, and one or two people are saboteurs or evil agents, and everyone else is a good agent, and you close your eyes, but the two people that are bad get to open their eyes and make decisions and kind of affect the game. I thought that would be like a really funny party game to like throw in a white dwarf and just be like, find gene stealers, <laughs> like gene okay. stealer cultists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find the, the people who've been infected or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I just thought that would be really funny, especially if you, instead of killing people, you were just adding more people to the gene stealer cult. Right, right, right. So it's like walking around the, the dinner party and like shaking hands with people and doing a little scratch scratch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the creepiest thing. I hate when people do the finger wiggle. Yeah. <laughs> finger wiggle. Oh, yeah. It's, that's a finger wiggle. Yeah. But it was just, as soon as you said, like, let's make up a game, I was like, that's my one. I'm going to do this somehow. 
Okay, so and it's and it's uh, are you are you theming it like solely in kind of the Imperial Guard rank regiments, or like is it in some kind of Imperial city? I think I or... would do it like oh, the Imperial Guard regiment would make would be awesome. The Commissar being the cop, yeah, yep. Yeah, I was thinking either do that or go full into, like, the weird Marxist stuff about the Gene Sealer cults and do it in, like, a machine shop. So oh. it's just, just like, imperial citizens that all work in a factory. <laughs> I just thought it would, like, be a funny idea. Yeah. Again, yeah. like, you just throw it in a white dwarf. And so what's, like, the main thing you're trying to accomplish side, oh, aside this from discovering who the people are so yeah you're not supposed to get found out if you're evil and then uh when everyone has their eyes open they sort of you're like actually playing this like we're actually walking around shaking each other's hands yeah yeah yeah. or like you're just around a table so you're not using miniatures no oh okay okay, this was this was again just like the first we didn't know there was a caveat that this must include miniatures yeah there's Uh, no rules we do what we want yep (laughs) rogue agents already (laughs) but yeah so then you sort of uh, secretly vote on missions or uh, different different sort of uh, happenings. So it's like, a, what's that one called? Resistance? Yep, Where you're exactly like, like you're that. You're going on a mission, but you, like, nobody knows what the actual mission is. It's just the, yeah. it's just the idea of like... Trying to accomplish something. Yeah. So like, that's what you would do, and the Gene Sealers would be slowly taking over the entire mm-hmm. cult. Yeah, I like the idea mm-hmm. of people becoming Jesus because none of those games have that element in it where people switch sides yeah so I, hard, I mean it's already hard enough <laughs> yeah well I just thought like it's not a, it, it wouldn't be like a competitive game or something that you play yeah um, it, it's more like hey it's a, it's oh yeah resistance is totally just about yeah the par- fun of it it's yeah. basically I was thinking it's a party game that you can backdoor the 40k universe on a bunch of unsuspecting game enthusiasts that don't know miniatures yeah totally so anyways get at me games workshop i'll totally produce this for you let's make some money yeah you can do like you come up with like yeah just sweet artwork around the whole thing like nice game boards and sweet little tokens and yeah great player cards well that's the nice thing about this game is that it only requires cards yeah so yeah yeah like a deck of cards Yeah, yeah yeah like bicycle cards yeah. Oh, really? I never well, that's the in that way. Yeah, that's the shape of them. But anyways, that's, Wait, that's the shape of them. The, anyway, the, let's like move if you on. played Avalon what? or the shape of the cards, you don't actually use playing cards. Yeah, you do. I've never done that with playing cards. That's how you figure out who's what. Is everyone gets dealt a card, and that is what determines who is is what role. Okay, we've never used bicycle cards. We like the. Playing cards, right? Yeah, like a deck of cards. Yeah, no, that's not how we do it. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, I've played, so Avalon and Resistance are both the same game, basically. Just one's like a... Skinned for fantasy and one's skinned for sci-fi. Yeah, exactly. Um, but did, have you ever played, you mentioned Saboteur. Have you actually played that game? Where I you're have like, it. Where you're like the gnomes I trying to get it. the gold. It's Yo, so that much fun. so good, right? I know. Yeah. We can oh, play it right now. Because you went bought it after we played yeah. it at Seascape. Um, yeah, well, we liked it we, so, but, yeah. yeah, we liked it so much. Then uh, at James's wedding, at the reception after the ceremony, they just had a whole bunch of tables with board games set up. So Paul, Julie, and myself, and two other randoms that we were like, "Hey, come play Saboteur with us." The five of us just played, and I trolled Julie's family so hard when we played Saboteur at her place. They weren't at the wedding. They weren't at the so wedding. You know. So I got them all to play Saboteur, and then I made everybody. But one person the saboteur, and Julie ended up being the one person who wasn't the saboteur. And she was like, What is going on? Oh, so the entire story is it's funny when I gaslight my girlfriend. Well, it could have <laughs> been my girlfriend's it been, family. It could have yeah. been me. I was okay. playing, right? Okay, so okay. I was just like, instead of four gnomes and one saboteur, it was four saboteurs and one gnome. That's, you guys are mean. You're just never going anywhere. It was hilarious to watch because. No, like this is like the third time we played, so yeah. nobody wanted to be like really obvious that they were the saboteur. So we got yeah. like two cards away from finding the gold, and then everyone's like, "Oh no!" And then it just got crazy. My pickaxe broke, and that tunnel collapsed. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. See, when I played saboteur for the first time, I thought that if I found the gold, 
and I was the saboteur, it was good. Like you, I thought, you win. I thought that I got to keep it. I didn't know that we were trying to stop anyone from ever getting it. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I found the gold. And everyone was like, what are you doing? And I was like, winning. And they're like, no, you lost. It's like, That's... oh, I fundamentally didn't understand the rules, clearly. <laughs> Well, uh, well, James's friend like was like, I'm the saboteur, and just put a dwarf card down. And they're like, no, you're just a dwarf. He's like, yeah, the saboteur. And they're like, we're all dwarves. <laughs> I mean, they didn't do a very good job of distinguishing him. No. He's just like kind of shifty looking. Oh, it says, then it it's says a, saboteur it's on your card. It's a bright red saboteur. Yeah. Some people can't read. That's fair. Yeah, so anyway, that's, running against people who that's, that's the first idea for a game that I had. Yeah, that's Dude, fun. Yeah, Adam, you got one? Okay, yeah, so my, I, it's not fully, it's not fully fleshed out, but I think there's, there's definitely some. What? Imp- I've got game designers ready to take these ideas to market. <laughs> like yours isn't fully fleshed out. Oh, shoot, okay, sorry, I screwed up, you know. <laughs> Don't shake the recorder. Um, but I have, there's certain, there's certain key game elements uh, from from other miniature games that I think would work really well in a skirmish based 40k game. And I know there's kind of an enough skirmish based 40k games right now, um, but it, none of them really like hit the mark for me. Um, anyway, so like Necromunda is cool. There's Kill Team. There's Shadow War, but none of them are really like like just taking the cake you know none of them just are, they're, they're not all the way there as far as what a skirmish game could be and they're more they're more like intro into 40k yeah you know they're like okay we want to make 40k more accessible to more people and so let's put out these simple easy skirmish games and so um what i'd love to see more of is um as opposed to being like in Kill Team where it's like, okay, uh, just spend 200 points, right? And then there's limits on two-up saves and vehicles or whatever. Um, uh, or like Shadow War, which is like you buy a squad of guys and then they kind of run around and do whatever. But they're all essentially scouts. So they're all essentially space marines. Or they're all gene stealers. Um, have it so that uh, there's a lot more character to each guy. Um, so first off, Nobody's just one wound. Everybody's, you know, three, four, or five wounds. So there's a little more survivability to each guy. Um, so you can have more fun just, just playing around with different things um, as opposed to just pulling off one wound models all the time. Um, but then every character has uh, just very unique abilities that affect stuff in-game. Um, so, like, either pushing or pulling guys or um, certain dudes that, that actually buff, buff other people. So everyone has a unique role. Right, as opposed to just I have a bolter or I have a melt a gun, right? Um, so I don't know how you make that work. Whether it's like a uh, an inquisitorial warband style game where it's just like okay, but I don't want to just play Inquisitor twenty eight or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Or it's if it's like a um, yeah, I don't know if you open it up to all races um, or if it's more like Necromunda, where basically everybody's everybody's fundamentally a human. Um, but they just have special abilities or whatever that make them their unique player. Um, and I don't want all the abilities just to be like, oh yeah, like I just get plus one ballistic skill. That's yeah, what makes me unique, yeah. right? Um, just some like, like I, I can heal people or um, I give I give somebody the ability to walk through terrain or like I can erect something that blocks your line of sight or whatever. Um and then, uh, and then because uh, because 40k is like purely gunfighting, I'd love to see it um, be more interactive between turns. So it's not just I go and do all my stuff, and then you go and do all your stuff. And uh, I think this is something that Infinity captures really well of the like gunfighting elements. Um, they do. There's a number of things that are that I don't like about that game um, as much that it wouldn't incorporate, but I really like their reaction system, right? So it's like, anytime I see you do something, I get the opportunity to react if it's your turn. Yeah. Um, and there's a number of different things that I could do. As simple as just shooting back at you with less effectiveness than I normally would if it was my turn, or like dodging out of the way, or um, trying to like hack you or something. Um, whatever whatever makes me unique as a, as a, as a, as a character, like I can, I can do that in your turn if I see you. Yeah. Right? And uh, 
So I know Necromunda has an element like Overwatch, um, but it's something where you, you literally, you're sacrificing everything you do that turn to do this. Um, but uh, it, it just doesn't do enough to make it this like really interactive gunfight um, for me, which I think is something that, that Infinity captures really well. So I think like a cool way to capture that is alternate phases. So it'd be like, I move, you move, I shoot, you shoot. I assault, you assault, and then at the top of the turn, have a roll-off to see who goes first every turn. Ooh, I kind of like that. Yeah. I told you that uh, when 8th dropped, my uh, my best friend who lives out west was playing 8th edition like that, mm-hmm. and he said uh, Eldar were impossible to beat, because uh, if you went first, you moved first, and you dropped down, then Eldar moved, and they just flew away from you. And then you're like, all my weapons are out of range now. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I, he's like, how do you beat Eldar? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, they just fly away from me in the movement phase. I'm like, shoot them. Well, I can't. They go before I can shoot them. I'm like, yeah. What do you, like, did you, what? did you apply the rules for the fight phase and spread them out to the entire game? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I think, yeah. like, that would be a really cool way and then to, like, get this really skirmishy feel in there. And then you that opens you up to things that break those rules, which will allow you to get those characterful units that you want. Mm-hmm. In. So, like, yeah. a psyker says, like, oh, actually, this guy can now shoot before, out of sequence. Like, yeah. kind of just do stuff like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm just going to interrupt you there. Do it. Uh, this is Doc Perdue's Bobcat. I don't think we've ever read this. We've had Ooh. it on the podcast before, but we've never read it. Doc Perdue was Blythe's veterinarian in the late 1880s who had a penchant for collecting exotic animals and a love of drink. A man close to my heart. When once cut off for being overserved, that's a funny way of putting it, uh, at the local saloon. Uh, Paul, you don't drink too much, you're just overserved. He marched home and returned to the bar with a bobcat on a leash, threatening to let it loose if he didn't get another drink. (laughs) What a classy human being. So ah. this is a West Coast uh, red ale from uh, Cowbell uh, Brewery up in uh, Blythe. They also do Absent Landlord and uh, a nice... Uh, what else do they do? Uh, I don't know. The, ca- the can looks a lot like the Bob Cajun can. Like it looks I mean, like... it looks like a beer can. Yeah. <laughs> it's got the opening on the it's... top. It's 473 mils. It's that that story reminds me of a story I saw on the internet. Uh, so take it with a grain of salt. Where a kid just grabbed a pigeon and walked into a GameStop and was like, "Give me GTA 4." And they're like, "No." He's like, "I'll release this pigeon." And they're like, "Don't do it." And he's like, "Give me GTA 4." And this kid got GTA 4 because he kept threatening to release a pigeon. He 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 held up a store with a pigeon. I don't believe the story. However, I part do. of Part of me loves that that as a concept, so I refuse to think it's not true. That's so funny. Mm-hmm. I love it. And you can grab pigeons. Like, you can just... Yeah. Like, we... you just squish them and then stick a hand underneath, and then you got a pigeon in your hand. Yeah. I uh, We had a pigeon that, that somehow snuck Ooh. in under our... Uh, we had a pigeon net around in, in an apartment on the east side in Greektown, um, but they got in underneath the, like, railing of our of our balcony and so my wife's cousin just like walked out there and just grabbed it while it was like (laughs) flapping in midair he just like just mangled it and just like shoved it through the the bars of our balcony and then off it went um so uh another thing is uh going back to the game so you're looking at more of like a a, a, it's a skirmish based game yep and uh not turn-based yeah, so I want to co- kind of come away from that, like, I just sit back and watch you do stuff to me. Yeah. Right? Um, so definitely more interaction. Um, and so I do like the, the reaction elements, so I'd in, in, incorporate that. I'm, I might not... So in, in, in Infinity, which is where I'm pulling this from, every time I see you do something, I get to react. I don't know if I would go that far. Um, maybe like one, every, like once per turn that I see yeah, you You just something. set a reaction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Like you go, if that person fires at me, I'm gonna suppressing fire them. Sure. Yeah. Right? It could be. It could be a, like I set them all up beforehand, so like I'm predicting what you have to do, or it could be I decide when you do it, yeah. which would be. Yeah. I like the idea of just deciding, right? Because I'm seeing you do it, and so then I, 
then I'd do what I want. And it's also like kind of cool because if someone's got their their dude set up for a reaction against like a certain unit, you can kind of rescue them or like sniper fire them just to like stop them from doing that because mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, I think it would give like a lot a cool order of operations feel to the game. Yeah. Now the other thing that's interesting too, and I think I think Paul, you were trying to get there, is uh, is a model by model activation. So we actually go back and forth all activating models mm-hmm. um, rather than uh, this like really really forty k mentality where it's like move shoot assault move shoot yeah. assault right. So it's like. We're only going to have like eight models each, you know, six six to ten models each, right? Yeah. Let's say. So like you activate a model and then I activate a model. Right. Um, so the only the only balance issue I see there um, is uh, if you have a, a, a an army that has more units. Yep. Right. Because you let's say you have five and I have ten. You've done your five. Well, now I've got five guys to do whatever they want. But I think a good way to balance that out is to be like each side has a certain number of uh, action points. Per turn. So even if you have 20 guys, you know, you're not getting to move all 20 guys before you move, after you just move your 10. Yeah. We, we, we reset the, you move your 10, I move my 10, we reset the turn kind of deal. Yeah, and that, like, again, opens up these characterful things where, like, maybe there's characters that allow you to do action-free movements or just, mm-hmm. yeah. There's, there's lots of fun stuff you could do with that idea. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. The uh the thing the thing that makes it not an issue in games where I've seen this is generally if you have a lot more models, um they're just not as good, right? Uh-oh. And so it's kind of yeah. it's kind of okay um because they're they're doing stuff that's not that significant, the little piddly guys. Um or the the interesting tactic then for you having, you know, getting a bunch of guys that are a little bit more insignificant is that like you draw out what your opponent is doing, and then you get to do your your big guys, right? So it's right. like I move all my piddly stuff that doesn't really matter, and then you you kind of force your opponent to do all their stuff, and then you finally get to activate your big stuff, yeah. which is okay. um, an interesting tactic. But um, anyway, so it's like the Inquisitor has, let's say, all his like alkalites, you know, just kind of he's he's giving orders or doing stuff, um, and then he finally like jumps into the fray. Um, and just starts busting heads. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's. Um, yeah. So then. Uh, so then the other thing um, is make it like heavily, heavily objective based, right? So it's a lot more. It's a lot more. I don't. I feel like narrative's the wrong word because it's too. Uh, there's a lot of baggage around that term. Yeah. Um, but that each mission is like heavily, heavily story based and feels unique mission to mission like feels very unique mission to mission yeah and and i i think you can pull that off with having like a number of objectives and having weighted objectives where it's like there's a main mission which can fail but you can still win the game with your secondary mission so like Mm. assassinate a character but also like steal all the credits from this guard um like terminal so no no one gets paid so you're yeah. like destroying the morale of like this regiment just just there is like yeah, they're not just fighting right they're like this side is like they're trying they're like just trying to steal intel mm-hmm. yeah or and, something and i love the idea that both sides have a different Objective. thing they're trying to accomplish yep. and so there's a there's a number of games um that operate where there's like there is there is kind of like one main objective but the um, but both players have something on the side they're trying to accomplish, right? And uh, and they're and they're very significant. You know, it's not yeah. like the main object. It's like, oh yeah, like sure, they're like very secondary, so they don't matter. Um, mm-hmm. That they're actually they're actually significant. So if you're not doing well in the in the primary, that uh, this will affect the game. Yeah, it's, yeah. I like I like those things, and that's like an easy way to get a narrative in there. Just being like, yeah, we didn't capture James Bond, but we got the we got the girl. Yeah, we got the girl. So now we can like kind of <laughs> paint her gold, suffocate her through skin breeding. It wouldn't it wouldn't work. No, that's not how people die. You can't kill someone. Yeah, like that. they probably just used a gun or strangled her. Yeah, pillows. Actually, a pillow takes a super long time. Movies lie to you. Um... <laughs> yeah, you can still breathe through that. Yeah, 
that's why my favorite scene of pillow smothering has to be i think is there a list yeah uh is good bad and the ugly also list where lee van cleef's character like goes to smother a guy with a pillow and then just takes out his gun (laughs) and shoots through the pillow like four times Oh, had to be four. He died of natural causes. Uh huh. This is the worst suicide we've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, shot four him. bullet shots to the head is definitely natural. Hey, man, physics is pretty natural. Yeah. Uh, guns don't kill people, physics kills people. <laughs> they asked me if I had a degree in theoretical <laughs> physics, and I said, I have a theoretical degree in physics, and they said, When do you start? <laughs> <laughs> this is why you should always have someone with an English degree on your staff. <laughs> Hey, that don't make no sense. <laughs> I don't know about you. Uh, awesome. So, to our point, just before we went on that ramble, I love the idea of somebody being able to win this game that we're kind of talking about right now and coming up with without killing anything. It would also be interesting to allow both sides to win. If they both have different objectives and they're both able to accomplish their objectives and get away. Because yeah. in, 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 okay. in war... Cause that it, could... it can happen, right? Because if, if my objective is to like you know seize the high ground and your objective is to retreat without taking a certain amount of casualties, we both, we've both achieved our objective. If I retreat, mm-hmm. you don't kill anybody, you end up at the top of the thing. Eh. Yeah, so I mean that would be a really cool campaign system too to just be like, listen, a, a win is you succeeding and your opponent failing. A loss is you not doing your thing, and a draw is you both get it. Like it's or you both don't. No, a dr- that would be a loss. Oh, it'd be a loss. Like it's always a loss if you don't both accomplish. Loss. That's a very different way of looking at things, and yeah. I, I really like it. Yeah, so I, I think that would just be a fun campaign system, which I am noting mentally. <laughs> like, yeah, we're almost done with the spring, so we have to do the spring campaign soon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I I really like that for even for just a forty k system. Just, yeah. You know, this is the this is the Imperium objective. This is the Chaos objective. They're entirely different and they're not uh, mutually exclusive. Yeah. They'll both be accomplished. Which we are going to have something similar to that for the Hog Timer. Will we? That I'm working on okay. in the background. Interesting. Okay. 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 Interesting. Uh, uh, so is that is that the the Toto of your the game that you were thinking of? Yeah, so then, so then the the other thing to flesh out is, and that that is a good segue into this is like, what does what does the game look like um, before and after? And I hadn't I hadn't decided if a so I really liked old Necromunda. It was like heavy, heavy into the um, the kind of how your gang is growing, and then I have these resources that I have to manage between games to like upgrade my equipment and like go out and actually find stuff that you know find better equipment or like or or do i send my guys to work work the fields or whatever it's not exactly like that yeah but to work your territories to to gain money get some more coin <laughs> and you have you have a lot of these decisions to make outside of the actual tabletop and i hadn't really decided do i want like is that just too much old necromunda that i just really want or is it uh is it something that is really valuable to the kind of game that I wanted to um, to set up here? And I think if it is a, uh, I mean that when you're doing stuff like that, you're automatically making it more of a narrative style game. And yeah. I'm not sure if I really 100% want to do that because I do like kind of the competitive elements um, of small skirmish size games. I think it actually is it's easier to balance than a company size game like 40k. Yeah. Um, but uh, but the second you do stuff, you're you're putting yourself in that category of like this is a narrative game. And uh, oh, the the second game I came up with is hard narrative. Yeah, like and that's fine, right? That's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, uh, but I actually find that there's probably a lot to be learned from the Blood Bowl community on this front because Blood Bowl is a heavily heavy narrative game where like your your team is growing your team is getting better your team is learning skills and that all happens between games and there's a lot of really effective competitive highly competitive tournaments that make good use of of those elements inside of their tournament which yeah. i find really cool so uh so yeah guys guys doing stuff like that give me hope that it could it could work but my natural reaction is to say i maybe don't want to pigeonhole it that way but yeah, i don't no. know so, so i'll pitch in my game now 
Yeah, do it right after we try uh, a new beer. Who brought this one? Me. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, these guys, uh, I think they're in Nixon, Ontario. Have they named a town after that criminal? Uh, he's not a criminal. He literally said it. Yeah. And you can't... We all know that presidents can't lie. If the president does it, it's not illegal. Yeah. Well, now we're... That was an okay Nixon. That wasn't a great Nixon impression. There's no good Nixon impression. I mean, besides Jimmy Carter, he's history's greatest monster. <laughs> but, I mean, I've realized that my favorite Nixon impression is people doing Billy West's uh, Nixon impression. Futurama? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I met you hippies halfway. <laughs> like... <laughs> I have to go leave the party for uh, cigarettes. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So Paul and I were talking before uh, before the podcast, and uh, we ended up talking about uh, some some more board game type games. Oh, guys, try this beer though, real quick. This is very very nice. This is like, oh, that's a oh, I love a Belgian wit. Oh, oh buddy. that is very like is very sweet. Like, it's a crisp very Belgian wit. There, mm. Oh, you could drink about a million of those. This traditional Belgian wheat beer is a light and refreshing ale brewed using Canadian wheat. Orange peel, coriander, and chamomile. It's the chamomile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chamomile shines through on this one. It's been fermented using a Belgian yeast strain, which adds an authentic spice and fruit profile. What was that? Oh, it's my knuckles. Oh, I thought... Oh, you weren't snapping your fingers? That was just you being old? Yeah, it's these knuckles right here. Thumb knuckles? Yeah. Oh, sorry, guys. But to get the full range of flavors this beer has to offer, uh, we should have roused the yeast before pouring the beer. How do we rouse yeast? I think you just give it a little swirl. Okay, well, I'm taking the last of this. This is delicious. Holy this is shit. really good. This is actually a really nice beginning of summer find. I'm just going to keep finding beers that Paul hates. <laughs> really? Because I want you to be happy. Uh, but go ahead with your, your, your game idea. There you go. Uh, so we were talking about uh, House on Haunted Hill. If anyone's ever played that game, it's kind of, uh, it's a fun, interesting game where you like start in the hallway and you play cards that go off each other. To, like, like they play, build the house. Reveal the, yeah. And here's the thing, here's the thing I love about this. This is how you backdoor role playing on all of your friends that aren't nerds. Am I pitching this game or are you? I mean, I can't believe He's just helping you sell it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you keep pitching the game. It'll <laughs> yeah. help you sell it. I'm the hype man. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so exactly, right? So, you, you, <laughs> you get your character. So, you, you've got the. Uh, so, first of all, anyways, we'll, we'll explain the, the base game and then how we port it over to the 40K universe. So, as you go along, you, you encounter things. You encounter like an aviary or an observatory or a, a science lab. And uh, once a certain condition's been met, the haunting is triggered. And the haunting could every be from one of the people in your party is a werewolf or a zombie or the blob starts growing or the house is possessed and you have to defeat the possession. And uh, I think this is just a fantastic opportunity for a, uh, a Space Hulk game because there is already a Space Hulk board game. But I don't think it really captures the tension of Space Hulk. Like if you're, you know, you're a Terminator squad, or even if you're just an Imperial Guard squad clearing a hab block, and you're revealing these cards slowly, you don't know what's around the corner. You don't know which way it's going to go, and there could be ten gene stealers in your face the next turn. See, I like House on Haunted Hill because of that suspense, and you don't ever know what the next card's going to. And I see. I think I would lean so hard on the narrative on this one. So you would have to you it you would always have an inquisitor, yep. and then you would kind of pick like acolytes, um, like you were talking about. But what you do for me is you give every player two or three, um, because I I want body count in this game. Yeah. But what you do is you kind of um, and this might be too much bookkeeping, but you have to like define the relationship between your characters. So, like, maybe, so the, it's the three of us, and maybe I look up to you, and you're my mentor, and Nick is my student, and you kind of, or 
vice versa, however you like it. And like maybe I have no strong feelings one way or the other about <laughs> you had glassy eyes. And like I'm, I'm interested. And maybe I'm this like is me paying attention to you. Okay, okay. I have glassy eyes. I was <laughs> huffing glue earlier, so sue me. <laughs> so like, you know, the relationship between those three characters, maybe like it's affectionate and like overprotective of, it is. of Nick. It is. And I then know. like it's okay. I'll I will let me spread my wings and I will fly. And with like Adam's leader character, this this character that's me, has like an ambitious like trying to prove himself. So when one of these characters dies, that affects a different character. So like maybe if the leader dies and you are ambitious towards him and like wanted to prove him, that makes you better. But if like you're the person that you like really cared about and you were like really, really into, they died, maybe that like makes you less good at like making like thoughtful choices. And I just I like the idea of this just rippling through your yeah, like you're insa- card. you have an insanity meter kind of right? thing, yeah. yeah. And and it's forty k, so you throw in the chaos gods, and all of a sudden, like people are barfing out baby versions of their grandfather. Like it can get nuts. Let's do that. Yeah, like literally house <laughs> on, and this is more like skinning. Yeah, right. But that's totally cool because um, one of the the great board games I played recently. Have you ever played Pandemic, Adam? Yes. Yeah. So you're so, trying to stop the infection. Yeah, yeah. So I played Pandemic Call of Cthulhu. Cthulhu. Whatever. Uh, and it was the same game, same mechanics, exactly the same mechanics, except just completely reskinned. Mm-hmm. So instead of little cubes of disease, which always felt a little too abstract for me, there's cultists. Have you ever been to a hospital? Yeah, there's cool. little cubes of disease, I know. Everywhere. And instead of the whole world, it's like a little New England town that's slowly being taken <laughs> over by demons. And every time, uh, you know, the the summoning is done, more cultists are added. And once the cultists reach a certain number, they summon a uh, a god, right? Um, the, an old one. I don't know. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't know there. Uh, well, the old there's like the old ones, and then there's like the kids of Yag Salath and. It's just a whole thing. Yeah. So then you've got to banish them. Uh, you've got people who can do different things. Like one person can take like one more action per mm-hmm. turn. One person can just travel. One person can like seal the gate to the other dimension with less actions. So it was like all of this cool stuff. And I'm like, you could totally do that in a, in a 40K themed environment. Do like a, a star system. And you're trying to stop a gene sealer infection. And oh no, you flip the card and now you've got to deal with a, a brood lord mm-hmm. oh shit and again I think like you should be able to deal with it by just saying like run away yes. like everyone like the, it shouldn't be entirely combat based oh no this is not uh, combat based at all yeah like I think that you need that element mm-hmm. because 40k it's got... like munchkin you played no uh, no it's D&D munchkin, light right, right? Is it? I, don't, I never played D and D anything, so it, it is D and D light, um, which is not a bad thing. It's just thing is a little easier to get into, um, and then a a more yeah. So that, those are my main game ideas. Um, I would like to see a total revamp of Battlefleet Gothic, but then kind of not because then I can't play with my antique models. <laughs> I mean, they'll they'll make provisions for the antique models. They always do. Yeah, and we'll we'll have we have at least a, a year Ten and a half still <laughs> before they rescan that. Sorry, re revamp that. Yeah, but yeah, I just think like a horror game would fit the 40k universe very very well. And mm-hmm. I like the house on haunted hill and a space Hulk or a, or a hab block, and it doesn't even have to be Ac- it could be a Terminator squad. Yeah, and you've got your librarian dude. Yeah, because mm-hmm. the issue with. The issue with Space Hulk, I think, is it doesn't feel like you're entering into territory that's unknown. Uh-huh. I right? think that's a big problem with a lot of 40k in general, especially when it comes to narrative. Yeah, because it just feels like you're trying to get the supplies. You're trying. Like that's actually why I like the. Ooh, I've got a good idea. Go ahead. So we've got a Zone Mortalis table, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't it be fun? To do a uh, kind of like an ambush thing, so like breach and clear. You got the just for an example, not picking on Paul. Yeah. Uh, you got the Imperial Fist. Their job is to clear this uh, this ship. It's unknown. It's drifting in space, and uh, I just put like pieces of paper 
over top of all of the pieces except for where Paul's deployed. And then every time he moves into a new area, I'll pull the pieces off the top of the board. Ooh. And then it's revealed. And then he's got to immediately deal with uh, with what's there. So I would set up the board beforehand, and as we go, we'd pull things. I really like this idea. Oh, Can we do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think to make it work, you double movement because it's going to be really slow. So you give you Crusader. Yeah, okay, yeah. whatever. I'm just saying, like, yeah. uh, I like that idea. <laughs> it's like a fog of war. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, and it it couldn't be just six turns. No, 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 no. It yeah, would have to be way longer. You just do unlimited turns. It would just be a fun yeah. sort of thing to. Try. Yeah, you do it as yeah. part of a narrative until campaign until you're dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have little markers there, and Paul's job is to investigate them, and it's just like your uh, your sergeant just gets dragged through the grate, and he's dead. <laughs> but like this, that's the kind he of needs thing. a chance to fight back. Well, that's <laughs> that's the reason why I like this relationship mechanic that i was thinking about where it's like if a sergeant dies you've got or like if something dies you've got someone who changes to not exactly replace but fill that leader role yeah um because like if it's an inquisitorial war band like we've we've read enough fluff that to know that like inquisitors don't retire <laughs> like no you know, yeah no, definitely not <laughs> like you know, something bad happens, and then like their apprentice is now like, "Well, I guess I'm the master of this book that blows up eyeballs. Like it's under my care now." Yep. So like, I I just think that if you wanted to go hard narrative, hard horror game like that, explorey game, mm-hmm. you could you could really like make some hay and have a lot of ton of fun. I think the Zomortalis one, we'll we'll definitely give that a shot. Mm-hmm. We'll do it with. Uh... Chaos versus Imperial Fists. Set an ambush for you and draw you on board. Don't do it. I'll do it. Oh. Uh, you guys got any other ideas? No, those are my those are my two. The, the and sh- actually, you know what? It's true what they say. Drink a couple beers for creativity <laughs> and then you need to drink coffee to stay focused. If you want if you like actually wanted to write this shit down, this is where we brew a pot of coffee and just write all night. <laughs> but before we started, I was like, I got nothing. Yeah. And then like <laughs> All of our ideas were pretty good, <laughs> right? Yeah, like yeah. I, I would be in Meeple Mart and pick up that box and be like, "I'm gonna tell." Oh, it's not on sale. Yeah, I, I'm gonna tell my wife about that. It's far in the future by the time that we have a game that I have <laughs> developed and forgotten about, and, I hope, and, I, <laughs> and are married. Well, I assume. <laughs> Who knows uh, what could happen between? I mean, that. if he made a game and forgot about it, like maybe he got married too. Maybe he forgot about that too. Connie, another man named Paul Fowler made this game. That was my idea twenty years ago. That's I you. Love that was Connie. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and Connor just got married. I said, "Honey, oh, I like honey. Connie." Connie's, I'm go- when I edit this, I'm going to just put Connie. <laughs> so, can you just say Connie? So I can just drop that in. Connie! Perfect. <laughs> Paul's off his meds again. <laughs> well, or back on them. Depending on the weekend. Just trying to make me shit my thumb bones out. <laughs>